Welcome to uh, the Mississauga Barbell Medicine Seminar Q&A. Uh, how this is gonna work, we'll work our way across the room, we'll go through each question. If it's offensive question, we'll delete it from the YouTube, but we'll answer it anyway. So the question is, if you're playing recreational sports, uh, could you consider that to be your GPP uh, one day a week? You could. The only time I wouldn't do that is if you have a specific health outcome that you are tra tracking down, i.e. decrease in waist measurement, insulin resistance sort of management via conditioning, in which case I think like a more formal approach to your conditioning should be taken. Um, the thing is, if you have not yet made a lot of improvement towards that goal, and this recreational pursuit is something you've done for a long period of time, I don't expect it to be enough of an exercise uh, effect to, to really help you out. So, do you have anything to add to that? No. Uh, maybe more. Yeah, and the only other thing I would add to that is I would not expect your performance in the gym to go down via a recreational pursuit that you enjoy, necessarily. Now, if your recreational pursuit involves like bodily harm, <laughs> like, rugby. like rugby, potentially, <laughs> but maybe not either. So, my, you know, in general, when people say, hey, I'm gonna start doing this, I haven't done it before, how is this likely to affect my training? And it's an activity. My assumption is that it's not until proven otherwise. Yeah, fine. Is hockey hard? No, I'm just kidding. I, this is coming from a guy who's not a great skater, so. Okay, so the question is about biohacking. Thoughts? Yeah, and a mention on oxidative stress. So biohackers are a frustrating bunch. Um, they are often, it's often I think a, partially a personality type deal. They're very hyper analytical type people and oftentimes come from like data type backgrounds or IT computer uh, kind of backgrounds where, where you are working with a lot of data and you're trying to optimize things and, and things like that. The problem is the body doesn't work like that. And on top of that, there's all the problems that I talked about during the, uh, the hormone lecture about the problems associated with testing. The data we get from our tests is not as necessarily as good as we would like it to be. So what a lot of these folks do is they go through either on their own or with the help of a practitioner who enables this behavior, does tons of inappropriate testing. Like they order every test under the sun and they go through meticulously and try to make sure that everything is smack in the middle of the normal range or at the upper end of the normal range, depending on what they think, where they think they should be. And if it's at the low end of the normal range, they consider that to be abnormal. Uh, and they try to push everything and they try to optimize things. And oftentimes that results in taking a lot of bizarre supplements. Like I had somebody who told me he wanted to optimize various levels, including his testosterone. And he had started supplementing boron to do this, which is one of the chemical elements that has really no significant physiologic effect in the body. Boron but, is boring. But he read that it could increase his testosterone levels, so he started taking a whole ton of boron. And I'm just like, what are you doing? You, know? you gotta optimize, bro. And probably didn't even need to have gone through this process of checking his testosterone in the first place. You know what I mean? So I think it results in a bunch of unnecessary hyper neuroticism about lab values when instead you could just live your life. I just went on living my life. Right, right. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think biohacking is a fruitless pursuit that's harmful because it wastes your time, resources, and nocebos you into thinking that there are a lot of things wrong with you. Mm -hmm. uh, I have not seen any of the biohacks that are pushed you know, in these circles to be effective at essentially anything except for removing mass from your wallet and reducing your performance overall. And any reported, I mean, not any, I can't make that broad of a claim, but many of the uh, benefits that are reported within the community are a combination of number one, placebo type expectancy effects. You, you found this abnormality, you try to correct it, you expect that you're gonna feel better when that number looks prettier. And a massive intra-community social learning effect, right? They're all interacting with one another, telling each other how much better they felt when they did this intervention or that intervention, and it's all priming one another to feel better when you do that stuff outside of physiologic effects. So. 
I would not recommend. Uh, Oxidative stress is a, it's something that is happening almost regardless, right? It, like your, your immune system, uh, it plays a substantial role in your immune response to things, for example. There can be excessive oxidative stress in yeah. certain situations, like, you know, don't smoke, that puts a bunch of unnecessary yeah. uh, metabolic stress on your, on, your, on your body and things like that. Don't but, over oxygenate somebody for too long, you know? <laughs> right, yeah, don't, don't breathe 100% oxygen, it'll be un generate a bunch of oxidative stress. Um, but, I mean, I think that we tried to hit on the high points of the common things from a health perspective that people should be concerned about this weekend. And that scene is so far down in the weeds that it's just not even worth our time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, Pandora's, oh no, sorry, Do You Believe in Magic? That's a great book to read on the, the some of these things. Yeah. All right. Uh, the questions about being underweight and why that is potential uh, increased risk of mortality. So most of that is from people who are very sick, meaning that they are actively losing weight or have lost a lot of weight secondary to illness or have a psychological problem that prevents them from consuming adequate nutrients. Um, I think that if you don't fall into either those two categories, that the risk is probably less uh, in general, although I'd still, as a, if I was treating somebody or seeing somebody in a professional setting who was under the normal BMI, or was underweight by BMI, then I would likely encourage them to gain weight. And whatever the barriers were for, to them to attaining a normal body, uh, normal body weight as, as evidenced by BMI, I would have to assist, uh, address that at that time. But if you're not somebody who's very, very sick, has a chronic medical disease who's making them lose weight and therefore being underweight, or if you don't have an eating disorder, for instance, that is preventing you from consuming adequate nutrition, then I think the risk is probably less, uh, you know, it's probably more in line with folks who are normal BMI. Now, when you're older, that kind of goes out the window, but then again, you're seeing more people who are chronically ill who have those low BMIs, so. Right, yeah, I think I agree with, with most of that. And Generally, the, the low body weight frailty syndrome that we see, particularly as folks get older, that's where stuff we get, we start to get more concerned with that. Um, we have some biomarkers that we can measure in the blood that correlate with the amount of muscle mass somebody has, for example, assuming their kidney function is normal, they yeah. measure their creatinine level. It's a normal, co common lab value that we measure all the time. And we have evidence that patients who are admitted to the hospital who have low creatinine values, um, meaning reflective of a very low amount of muscle mass, they have a higher risk of mortality. Yeah, in the um, hospital. I think in the cutoff hospital, yeah. was like 0.4 or something like that. Yeah, and I've actually seen one patient ever who had an undetectable creatinine level, and that was secondary to a muscle-wasting disease, and they were obviously at very high risk of, of dying from that. So if you were just young and otherwise healthy and you didn't have anorexia or, or some other eating disorder or you didn't have a malabsorptive GI disease like you know some inflammatory bowel disease and you couldn't absorb any calories or some other reason for that, then yeah, I would agree that I wouldn't be super concerned about your risk, but as you get older, you don't want to be super underweight, not just for the amount of physiologic reserve that you have when you're of normal weight in case you get sick, if you're tiny and frail, it hits you a little harder. Um, but also as you get older, if you're very, very underweight, it's a risk factor for something like osteoporosis. Um, and if you're very, very low body weight, safe to assume you probably have low muscle mass. So low muscle mass, often reflective of low strength levels. And if you have osteoporosis, low bone mass, then you're at risk for falling, breaking a bone, which has a very, like hip fracture, very high mortality rate. So these are all places we can intervene, get people's body weight and strength up through this stuff. Yeah. I think that we can strongly recommend against the consumption of trans fats. Outside of that, I don't think that we can make very strong uh, claims about the inherent healthfulness or harmfulness of a particular food. I think a lot of it has to do with dietary context, the amount of it that you're consuming, the dose, right? And the health uh, conditions or comorbid diseases that a, per that a person might have. Does that make sense? So certain food in a certain person who may have a certain medical problem may be more or less advisable, but uh, you see a lot of this in social media and uh, in nutrition guru land about this food is inherently bad or fattening or inflammatory or whatever. People for some time, for some reason, say this a lot about dairy um, whereas we have very little evidence, you know, majority of the evidence base that we quoted a lot of this weekend suggests that it's a very helpful thing to consume. 
So I think that when you see claims about things like uh, toxic effects or infl inflammation or just these kind of broad nebulous things, you should look for a little bit more specific uh, support for those claims because it's easy for somebody to pick their pet food they want to vilify and say, oh, it's, it's inflammatory. What does that mean? How are you measuring that? How are you determining it? What are you measuring in someone's blood that is, that is showing me evidence that it's inflammatory? And not just the blood level, but what's the consequence of that? Do you have evidence that that inflammation is quote-unquote inflammation is resulting in some disease process or making them die sooner or something that I care more about than a blood test. Does that make sense? So, yeah, we don't really tend to vilify foods in general. It's a very good question. So the question had to do with taking uh, everything that he learned from here this weekend about the various topics that we presented about and going out into society and trying to educate other people on this stuff is likely to meet a lot of resistance. Um, and oh, let me repeat it so you're here, because I think this is good for both of us to discuss. He said that his question is, uh, we're at the end here. Um, uh, this guy? After everything he learned this weekend, going out into society and trying to educate people on this, feeling like he's likely to meet a lot of resistance from mainstream ideas, because this stuff is sometimes counterintuitive or uh, against what would logically be apparent. Um, and so how do we best manage that situation? How do, we, how do we be the most persuasive we can? How can we be the most persuasive we can about this? Thing? Yeah, I mean, so we talked, we talked about this in our Brooklyn uh, Q&A as well, which is on the YouTubes. So I'll try to maybe say something different. There are some people who have no desire to actually hear what you have to say. Don't waste your time. That's gonna just upset you and waste a bunch of your time where you could be doing something productive or not doing anything, which would be more productive than arguing with these folks. There are some people who are curious, and the exchange of ideas with other folks who are open-minded is usually beneficial for both sides. So I think you have to first identify who you're dealing with. Is this person open to hearing what you have to say? And similarly, are you open to hearing what they have to say? And I think ultimately, if you are agreeing to an open exchange of ideas, then it comes down to the data. And the data kind of guides your thought process. Now, if someone rejects science altogether, you can't have this conversation. There's not, there's not a conversation to have. So, again, you, you just gotta, you have to state some ground rules, right? So, if you're discussing a particular topic, you guys both agree to have, be open-minded, that they're willing to change their mind, you're similarly, you're willing to change your mind, and that you're both willing to agree that science is a valid field and will, and that the data can help answer questions that are answerable. And so with almost in any like query that you might have, there are answerable questions and unanswerable questions. And I think that letting the data kind of guide your thought process and subsequently, if they agree, guide their thought process, that's how to make this productive. Because I think you run the risk of wasting a bunch of time on people who will not, they're not even, a, a, available to consider your, your thoughts. And similarly, if you're not willing to consider their thoughts, then they feel offended. And they're like, well, why am I even participating in this thing in the first place? The other thing is uh, if they're not willing to accept science or if you're not able to provide science for them, then it's just people talking about stuff that there are answers for, but nobody's willing to kind of engage in the sort of rigorous process needed to, to, to come to a conclusion. So if their ground rules are we accept science, we're gonna use that, we're both open-minded, then that can be a very potent discussion. So I think when Austin and I, like we disagree about things from time to time and then we'll go back and forth and then we have both have these, it, it's not stated, you know, we don't have, we don't have to sit down and say, okay, here are the rules and sign a contract and then it comes back and forth, but we both are like-minded in that, okay, I'll listen to what you have to say, He's, I'll listen to what you have to say and then we'll just let the data do the talking. And that's kind of how we, how we do this. I think uh, you all may have seen a lot of the stuff I share from the uh, kind of the cognitive bias side of things, particularly my favorite podcast to pimp, even though I get nothing in return from uh, promoting them. Oh, the no. You Are Not So Smart podcast. So I would listen to as much of that as you can yeah. because it really helps you when you are observing human interaction yeah. and behavior to the point where when you start going down this path with somebody, you can very quickly get a sense of, is this likely to be a productive conversation or not? Yeah. So now I'm much, I very, very frequently now 
get either pulled into internet conversations or I'm talking to somebody in person. And if I get a sense that this is going nowhere, I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. And it's move on worth, with my day. It's not worth it. There's somebody else out there who's willing to discuss this with you. Yeah. You so know? I think that being aware of those things, having some sort of screen where you can try to tell, is this person open to this? Are they, are they ever, can you foresee them ever changing their mind? If the answer is no, then move on. Yeah. And you should then have uh, uh, a kind of set of resources for the topics that you are passionate about. So I have a set of resources that I can provide people for when it comes to the pain stuff or any of the topics that I care about where I can get my foot in the door and say, hey, why don't you check, take a look at this stuff and then we can talk about it. If they don't want to have the active discussion, because that can be confrontational or once emotion comes into play or they get defensive, backfire effect, all these sorts of things start happening. Um, so offering a low confrontation alternative to be yeah, exposed hey, to this out. stuff yeah. can be helpful. Um, so yeah, those are, that's probably the approach that I take with most people. Yeah, on, on the other hand, if, I, if somebody tags me in something on Instagram, right, and it's like, thoughts? And it's on somebody else's page, and it's something that the person who tagged me knows that I'm like, mm, probably not a big fan of, I either don't respond or say, that emoji. <laughs> because because what, what's likely to happen from that, right? Like, I, I'm gonna say, hey, I think you should read this, this, and this, and they're gonna say, no, read this other thing. And I'm like, well, I'm not gonna read that. You know, I, I'm not gonna engage in a debate in, with somebody who's not willing to provide similar resources or have this open dialogue, you know? Yeah. And if someone's saying, hey, go read Tim Ferriss's blog, I'm like, absolutely not. <laughs> like, I have better things to do, like not read Tim Ferriss's blog <laughs> or, you know, not read Tim Ferriss's blog. <laughs> so, yeah, I think, again, it just has to be some sort of state, ground rules and uh, yeah, arguing with people on the internet is less fun. I'd like to talk to people in person. I think that's powerful stuff, so. Okay, the question I do with strength training for injury prevention and the degree to which that strength training intervention needs to be specific to the athlete's sport, correct? Okay, uh, so our new colleagues that we have brought on board, Mike and Derek, uh, are very much into the sports rehab and injury scene. So I've interacted with them a whole lot over the past year, two years, we are probably sending each other multiple links to papers every single day, which informs a lot of the stuff we talk about. Uh, so they would take issue with the idea of injury prevention. They would say that we cannot prevent injuries. They would say that we can reduce the risk of injuries, which appears to be a semantic difference, but it's one that is worth mentioning. We can risk reduce. Uh, there was a recent meta-analysis that I posted about uh, that I think we're writing a little something about, a meta-analysis of I think six trials regarding strength training and subsequent risk of injury outcomes. And the relative risk reduction in that trial was substantial. It was like 66% reduction in the rate of injuries when these athletes or military cadets, which were in one of the trials that was included, uh, were what underwent strength training. One of the issues with it is that I think three out of the six trials had to do with the Nordic hamstring protocol, which is not a, what we would, what we would all recognize as strength training. It has to do with like body weight eccentric hamstring, hamstring curl, curls, yeah. right? So like slowly lowering yourself under control. But if that is the predominant injury risk in that population, right, having to do with hamstring injuries of some sort, and that intervention appeared to reduce the risk by 66%, that is a notable finding. Something, something that we should pay attention to. Uh, we have to be careful about how we generalize that in terms of saying, oh yeah, that means that if you low bar squat and deadlift and press, that you're never gonna get injured. What right? about sumo deadlifts? Inappropriate, sumo deadlifts don't work. What about high bar? Doesn't work. What about incline bench? Nope. Nope. So, <laughs> about when you say general versus specific, of course, you know, if you're talking about an a, 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 a running athlete who's gonna be uh, on their legs most of the time, you talk about Getting their bench press up is going to reduce their risk of injury. Yep. Well, maybe a oh. little bit from some other bizarre injury, but probably not from the most common types of injuries that they might sustain. Right? They're prone to ACL stuff or you know other kind of or other kinds of things like that. Yeah, there has to be some degree of specificity to to the training. Do you want to? Yeah, I I think that well the mechanism by which getting stronger decreases the instance of reporting pain or missing games or uh, seeing a physician is likely more transferable from movement to movement, 
what, what I mean by that is even if it doesn't mimic what you're doing in sport the, or recreational pursuit, that there are other more global mechanisms such as increased pain tolerance, for instance, uh, decreased sensitivity to sort of uh, nociceptive stimuli. Um, and I think uh, overall, you have to tolerate quite a bit of discomfort during training that carries over to being able to tolerate that later on. So there's some, there's some of that. But yeah, even defining what an injury is is difficult and then injury prevention, that phrase in and of itself, yeah, you can, you can argue about that. So I, I think that getting stronger in the gym, which is what a strength conditioning coach would do, and if we say strength is specific, which it is, then you would say that getting stronger in barbell training uh, for you know, uh, heavier, heavier weights, uh, that's probably not, doesn't need to be very specific to the training or to the sport, meaning that if you're a sprinter, you don't need to sprint with heavier and heavier weights or faster, you know, over speed running, even though those things may be beneficial to your performance uh, or otherwise uniquely beneficial for reducing injury, reducing pain reports. Rather, squatting might uh, influences that a little bit. So that's more generalized. So that's what I'm getting at. Uh, same thing with like baseball players, whatever. There was uh, there are two studies that I'm thinking of where they had them chest press, and those who had the highest uh, largest improvement in their chest press ten, uh, had the lowest uh, uh, amount of, uh, of pain reports uh, throughout the season. Now, whether or not that means that improving your chest press decreases the amount of pain that you're going to have if you're a baseball player, I don't know. But it certainly does seem that strength, improving strength has to have some effect on uh, uh, pain reports and missing games. Yeah, so I would recommend you, I actually posted about this paper in our Facebook group, the one that I cited. I would go there, find the paper, and actually look at the, subs the, in the included trials. If you're interested on the topic, that seems like a worthy yeah. endeavor, so you can read this stuff and see what the interventions did. The pain, the pain science uh, article on sports injury prevention is also pretty useful. It covers why things like stretching and myofascial release and stuff like that doesn't work, getting stronger would help, and then ultimately controlling acute on chronic fatigue is probably and workload is probably the, the biggest the biggest one. So if you have a person, let's say they're a ball baseball player, and they normally play you know one game a week, two games a week, and then all of a sudden they have this huge tournament where they're playing you know seven games over the span of four days. They've got a bunch of you know whatever. I don't know what, what, how that would happen, but let's say it did. Then you would worry that wow, that's a lot a big influx in you know stress that they may not be ready for. So uh, more applicable would be like CrossFit Games. If you're if you got a CrossFit Games athlete, those folks have to train like crazy just to get prepared for the workload they're about to be exposed to, you know. So people are like, how do they do? How do they tolerate all this? Well, they train all year and many years in a row to be able to tolerate that. If they couldn't, they wouldn't have made it to where they're at. And some still break. You're correct. So there's a, <laughs> definitely a genetic input there, right? Genetic inputs, but a lot of also just training resources being uh, pushed towards being able to tolerate the level of sporting stress required to be successful in that sport. So. so the question was, inflammation, what is it, and how do you deal with it, like in common cases such as tendinopathy, end quote. Okay. Nice. So, <laughs> so inflammation is an immune response. So your immune system is comprised of a number of different types of cells that generate inflammation. And inflammation, what that means is that there's a bunch of chemicals that get secreted by these cells, and these cells come in and they eat pathogens, for example, if you have an infection going on, let's say you have like a skin infection, and it gets red and hot and warm and swollen, that's all inflammation. That's all stuff that happens because of the effects of your immune system and inflammation, right? Inflammation, as I said earlier in one of the other questions, is a very vague, broad term, however, and it's overused inappropriately by a lot of people. Uh, they think that whenever they feel bad that they have inflammation, for example, or... That's why I feel bad. Right, right. That I must be inflamed or something like that. Inflammation definitely happens uh, in the setting of an acute injury, uh, in the setting of acute infection, uh, in various other situations like autoimmune diseases and things like that. I think, I don't think it's worth being excessively worried about inflammation in general. And that's kind of in line with our other ideas about recovery in general. People tend to over worry about that stuff outside of things like food, sleep, right? Yep. Tendinopathy is unique in that tendinopathy is not a particularly inflammatory condition. 
Right. There are inflammatory cells that they find under micro, uh, uh, microscopic and uh, high-powered mic uh, microscopic examinations, but we don't think that that is the cause of the tendinopathy. Yeah. Tendinopathy is not super, super inflammatory. And that is part of the reason why, if you were to just take some ibuprofen or some naproxen when you have a tendinopathy, it does not tend to cure the thing. It needs a much more long-term approach related to managing training loads, um, and just tamping down inflammation doesn't tend to help. In fact, there is some literature have particularly common having to do with uh, uh, extensor tendinopathy, like tennis elbow where they actually do injections at the elbow of corticosteroid, st steroid injections at the elbow, and this is anti-inflammatory steroids. Those patients, if you follow their outcomes at a year after the injection, they do worse compared to people who did not get an injection or to people who did physical therapy and exercise. So if you try to go and tamp down inflammation in their extensor tendons of their elbow, they do worse at a year compared to people who didn't. Yep. Um, so I don't recommend being overly concerned with inflammation is a natural response, unless you have an autoimmune disease, it's a natural response to things like injury because it promotes healing. It's a natural response to infection, helps us kill infections. So it's a good thing, it's a protective mechanism, just like pain is a protective mechanism most of the time, right, until it's not. Um, so I don't recommend being particularly concerned about it and tendinopathy needs a separate approach, not one that's concerned with inflammation at all. Cool. Yeah, so the question is, uh, can becoming obese cause irreversible health? Adverse health outcome. Sure, I like that. Right. That's okay. a, yeah. uh, theoretically, and I mean, definitely evidence to suggest that becoming obese can, does indeed, or ever being obese in your life can cause uh, adverse outcomes. So if you've ever been obese in your entire life, then your risk of all cause, like cardiac, disease mortality is a little higher than if you never become obese. If you have somebody obese in your family, your risk of developing diabetes is higher than somebody who doesn't have anybody who's obese in their family. Oh yeah, I got this, but you guys don't have that. The evidence isn't that great though, is what I'm getting at. And I think if, if you are trying to consider whether it's a good idea to lose weight or not lose weight, if you have obesity, the answer is probably a good idea. Uh, just, just on outcome, because I, I would prefer to think that I'm in some control <clears throat> of my destiny, even if that's a fruitless thought, even if we're just, you know, walking sacks of water, responding to stimuli <laughs> based on our genetics and environmental exposures prior to that experience. However, I, I do think that you could make a reasonable argument that becoming obese has some damage potential. And I would not advise somebody to do so in the quest of putting 30 more pounds on their total <laughs> because no one cares. I mean, really, you know, if I had a person who came to me and said, look, I want to be a pillar in the strength and conditioning community, how do I do it? The answer is not to, you know, become obese and run your linear progression to the highest level that's ever been done. The answer is to get popular on Instagram. <laughs> so, those two things are <laughs> probably mutually exclusive. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, and further, the other thing I'll say, the more germane question to this particular setting is, do you always need to gain weight to get stronger, and when is the risk of becoming potentially obese worth the risk of getting stronger? In my estimation, the risk of becoming obese, uh, or getting obese to potentially get stronger, the only time that risk is worth the, the uh, or less than the benefit is when you're over the age of 65. The older folks tend to have to have lower mortality rates at when they're overweight or have class 1 obesity uh, when you're over the age of 65 compared to normal weight and especially underweight folks. But still, those people with the BMI of over, in 35, over 35 have the highest mortality rate. So uh, I think other than that, if you're not in that category, then don't, don't become obese. Right? Don't develop a medical condition just so you can squat 315. <laughs> Your doctor is not going to be impressed. Just imagine that, that, inc I'm, that includes us. Just imagine <laughs> that I'm your doctor, right? And you come in and your blood pressure is, you know, 150 over 90. And you said, yeah, but I squat 315. I'm like, cool. 
Like, you know, I, I'm pumped that you're training, right? That's good, something I can leverage for, for other lifestyle modifications, but I don't think that that risk uh, uh, outweighs the benefit in that situation. Uh, the question is, any plans on expanding coaches to Canada? Uh, we would love more coaches. What we're working on now, there's, there are a handful of different things that we're trying to do. So the first thing is there's a, a fairly lengthy process to get this seminar approved for continuing med medical education units, so CMEs that doctors have to use to maintain their credential, uh, and also uh, get this approved for CEUs for people who are already coaches. What we would like to do is have some sort of barbell medicine vetting process where you get to become a, co a barbell medicine vetted coach and run your own business. Because you know? we don't want the same thing to happen with SSOC to happen with us. You want a coach and you're familiar with our stuff, we'd love to refer you business, but we don't necessarily want to tie your success or failure due to anything that we do unless you're up for that. You know? So we wouldn't mandate that, oh, you're advertising that you went to a barbell medicine seminar, you're barbell medicine certified, but you have to tr coach through us. You might have different thoughts, and we want to foster that open, yeah, yeah, the open source kind of think tank sort of mentality where you have a different idea, you want to propose to us, we all talk about it, come up with something. And if, it's, and if you end up saying at the end of that conversation, like, hey, uh, I just dis I disagree, and we say, we disagree, well, that's fine, you don't have to leave, you just go on living your life. <laughs> uh, but we do think that there's utility in having folks who have like that barbell medicine stamp of approval in this sort of hybrid community, this like health and strength training. What's that? Broccoli thins the skin. What? Wait, does it? Is that why I have wrinkles? Yeah, this whole time, man. Yeah, I think part, so, so we, do have, we do have numerous projects underway having to do with kind of setting up the infrastructure that would allow us to do such a thing. Got to run? All right, thanks. Hey, man. Uh, part, of the, part of the issue is, as you can imagine, so, so we presented as, we packed as much as we possibly could into this weekend, right? Uh, it would be great if you could retain like 15 or 20 percent of what we talked about, right? And this is a fraction of what we would want to talk about. So there's so much, and we have to decide where is our standard going to be. Uh, Baraki has a very high unattainable standard. Yes. Left to Baraki, yes. nobody would ever be good enough, <laughs> including himself. Right, right, yes. So, so we have to figure that out. We have to get the educational content in place so that the resources are there to develop the people. So we're working on all this stuff. It'll take, tomorrow. It'll take some time. Yep, but we're doing some online ed development stuff where you get to take courses through us. One of them will be worth college credit through JMU, James Madison University, it's the University of the United States, um, and some other stuff will be related to coaching development, a, nutri a nutrition one, and then sort of like a, a medical uh, comorbidity one where basically the, the disease states that we talked about here, like what do you need to know as a coach, you know, that'd be helpful. Basically is a counter to the ACSM HFS. So the ACSM is the American College of Sports Medicine. They have a health and fitness specialist uh, credential that you can obtain is not useful. What's that? No, yeah, I, most certifications are not useful. In fact, my argument is that the only certifications that you should get would be ones that either increase your business immediately by having them, either by listing you on some resource that people frequently go to and subsequently decide where they're gonna spend their money, okay? Uh, or if you need one to get a job somewhere. So right now there are only a handful of ones that fit the former criteria, like actually make you money. One of them is the Titleist certification. That's uh, for golf. So most people who play golf tend to have some money. If you have the title of certification, the actual material is not useful. But if you're on that list, you're the guy. The question is, if you're going on vacation for an extended period of time, which we're going to define as greater than one week, is there a way to minimize your detraining? Uh, if you are defining detraining by absolute weight on the bar, on squat, bench, deadlift, press, very definable exercises, the answer to that is no without squat, bench, deadlift, press. Unless you're talking about comparing like complete bed rests to you know, being fairly active. It would be difficult to argue that doing push-ups and body weight squats and lunges, uh, picking up coconuts on the beach while you're drunk, that those would significantly contribute to maintaining your strength. That being said, it'd be hard to argue that those would negatively affect your strength directly either. The worst thing you could do is not do any activity. 
that's the worst thing you could do. I would expect with a prolonged layoff that somebody would lose some mus muscle cross-sectional area, okay? But the actual contractile uh, elements of their muscle would remain and the myonuclei, the number of myonuclei that they would have would also remain. So even folks on bed rest for periods of weeks will lose a significant amount of muscle mass. However, their myonuclei number, those are the areas of the muscle fiber that actually are responsible for maintaining uh, the protein content in certain areas of the muscle. So there's a myonuclear domain, right? So each nuclei has an area that it maintains the protein content there. So the number of myonuclei persists, the domain persists, and then when that re person re returns to activity, that expands rapidly back to its original size. That's actual muscle memory right there. So I would expect that if you are unable to participate in any sort of barbell training, no squats, no bench, no deadlift, no press, and then you go back three weeks later and you try to squat, bench, and deadlift, uh, squat, bench, deadlift, press, which you did before, that it's unlikely that you would maintain your peak level performance. That said, I would expect your peak level performance to respond, or to uh, come recover. back. Yeah, recover fairly readily. Lay down in a bed for three weeks, not do anything, drink all the alcohol, do all the recreational drugs, uh, you know, and take up veganism. He's like, come on, sounds like a vacation. Well, yeah, I also wouldn't do anything before you left, because I, I don't know if you were asking about, should you do anything before you leave to modify that? Yeah, no. Nope. I would not do anything different before you leave, as long as you're not like actively peaking and reducing your training volume right before you leave, because then you're starting to detrain before you even leave. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Um, during your vacation, I would, I mean, I would continue finding some way of remaining active for yeah, sure. You can lift but when you come back, your performance is likely to be down, but I would not assume that it's going to be down massively because yeah. you may surprise yourself. So different people, depending on their anabolic sensitivity or anabolic resistance, they may, they may maintain a greater or lesser proportion of their training base, right? So we get asked this all the time, how do I train for maintenance? And I say, I don't know. Depends on your training sensitivity. If you are super, super training sensitive, it probably doesn't take very much for you to maintain your strength. Yeah. Like my wife is a freak training sensitive person. That's true. She can not squat for six weeks and then come back into the gym and toss up 275 like air. Yeah. Whereas somebody who's very, very training resistant is gonna detrain much quicker. And so for maintenance, the training sensitive person needs less, the training resistant person needs more. But, you know. And then, when, but when you come back, the bigger thing you're probably going to notice right off the bat is your skill yeah. is going to be compromised. It's going to decay. That decays have, a little bit faster. Will, yeah, yeah, that decays pretty quick. You will not have practiced any of these movements in three weeks. Yeah. So, if that's the length of your vacation. And so, you may be tempted to confound the skill loss and how that feels. Your squat feels off. You can't squat as much because it feels wrong. Your technique is off with detraining, which might not be the case. And once you, you groove things back up quickly, then your strength may, more of your strength may be there than you expect. Yeah. If I used uh, some sort of electronic stimulation device to see what your maximum, uh, maximum contractile force production could be, it may not be that different after three weeks of not training with barbells. But when you combine that with a particular skill context like the squat, that may be down. I wouldn't do anything before, yeah, except for not peak. So, yeah, so the question is, do you try to program in a way to avoid tendinopathy, or do you think it just happens un, uh, as an unintended consequence of strength training in some folks? And I would say the latter. So basically, you, you, the only way you could predict it is if you had a very robust training history in somebody, and they had diagnosed tendinopathy routinely as soon as they hit a certain, uh, like, you know, training threshold of fatigue, and then you just did the same thing again. And it, whoop, happened again. So something, usually tendinopathy, I mean, it's fairly complex in its uh, origin, but you would try to avoid the same, um, uh, both type and amount of fatigue and how rapidly that occurs in a person. So if I knew that every time I took somebody's squat up to three times per week, that they bang on, had some, symptoms of tendinopathy, I would try to avoid that in the future. So I would either pick a different variation or I would not go up three times a week and in fact instead expand the volume in other training sessions or I would lower the overall average intensity while adding a third session. Something to try to change the intervention to try
try to get a different outcome. That's really the only way that you could program in a way to prevent tendinopathy in a person who had it, who was therefore susceptible to it by definition. Um, otherwise, you just accept, oh, crap, that happened, and try to figure out why to the, the, to the degree that the why is modifiable for that person. I think the other things you can do is to pay attention to the just general injury risk factors that we talked about. Yep, acute so on chronic workload. Acute on chronic workload yep. is a huge thing. So if all of a sudden, after your three week training, your fourth week of training, I jack up your training load by 20%, that is not a smart move. Come on, man. Right? Try your jack, bro. Yeah, not right. a smart move. Make it more gradual. Session RPEs, if they are, have a ton of allostatic load, remember that was another risk factor, a ton of allostatic load, all, this, all kinds of stuff, and all their sessions are 10 out of 10 grinding type sessions, yeah, that's run, not a smart move. Just run it out. Not just even for tendinopathy, but for injury in general. So I just pay attention to the general injury risk factors and don't tend to uh, jack up training load too quickly and, uh, and control, and it's one of the benefits, I would argue, of specifically programming based off RPE is that you can avoid constant high session RPE loads that increase the risk of injury. Because yep. it keeps that you, you kind of tug on the reins a little bit uh, rather, than, rather than people exposing themselves. So, so here's kind of the idea that, I, that I've described is when a, when a coach writes a program and they write for you to squat a set at 78%, they pick that number on purpose, right? It, well, but, hopefully. Hopefully, they picked that number on purpose. There was some intention behind that specific number. But let's say we all know that our strength fluctuates day to day, right? We've had 10% swings in our strength performance sometimes, and it's yeah. not fun when it's down, and it's fun when it's up. But performance swings. As so let's say it. it's a down swing of your strength performance. What was previously thought to be 78% of your 1RM on that day is 86% of your 1RM. Yep, Got to do it. Right? And it's, it's, on the it's five at 78. But you say, it's on my program, I'm not deviating from my program, I'm not changing anything based on my feelings, whatever other argument you're gonna use. Feelings aren't and real. And you squat the set of five that was 86% of your 1RM on that day. <laughs> you just went off program. Yeah. You're not doing the program. Yeah, the desired training That's a problem. was not correct. So that was not the, that was not the intended effect of yeah. the training program. By adhering to the program, you went off program. Okay. That is, the benefit that we talk about when we program with things that account for this fluctuation, an auto-regulated style, yeah. right? This rigid obsession with I must do what's on the paper, silly. Yeah. Increases risk of injury when the stress becomes inappropriate from high session RPEs, good on chronic workloads, unless you want to ignore that evidence. Well, right? science and it's unproductive. Good. It's unproductive. Okay. That's enough for now. Uh, that was my... All right. All right. Next question. <laughs> uh, so this is a question. Asking for a friend. Not asking for a friend. Sure, me too. <laughs> <laughs> How are you defining strength? I yeah, well. That's what I'm saying. It's not my question. So sure. How about, let's say, we don't buy for yeah. Saturdays? Yeah, so I think for most strength, if we're defining strength as performance between like a 1 and a 5 RM, then improvement in performance there is most tied to programming, period less tied to nutrition unless you're hemorrhaging weight, right? Or actively having to, or you're malnourished or have a disease state that's compromising your nutritional intake. So you, someone broke your jaw because you said something incorrect <laughs> and you can't, you can't eat. So that being said, um, what's more important, volume or intensity? Well, they're both important in so far as the amount of volume that you have to do needs to be at the appropriate intensity to generate the stated outcome that you're desired, the stated adaptation that you're desiring, which is an improvement in some strength test, one to five rep max and squat, bench, deadlift, press. So as long as the intensity is within the, what we consider to be the productive range, which for repetition work, we, ex we think is in that 70 to 80% range with regular exposure to 90 to 95%, something like that for things that are relatively low stress, but high adaptation to the specific test that you're trying to uh, get better at, uh, volume's more important, right? But if you're just saying that it's gotta be one or the other, pick one, gun to head, well, intensity is germane to this discussion. 
because you're saying one to five RM. Well, now I know the intensity range, the specific test has to be heavy. It has to be heavy to get better at that. That doesn't mean that all of your work has to be near limit sets. And it can't be if you're going to do enough sets to generate enough stress to drive the adaptation. So both are important, but once you once you've like set the ground rules that most of your developmental strength is going to be done, uh, the, the, the intensity range is going to be 70 to 80 percent of your one RM at a given point. Okay, uh, with regular exposure to singles or or low amounts of volume in that 90 to 95 percent range, then overwhelmingly the most important factor is volume. 70 percent compared to 73 percent. Yeah. That's more psychological, right? So I have programmed a linear progression, meaning that in regular intervals, things go up. So 70% for X amount of volume for two weeks, then 73%, then 76%, then 79%, or well, something like that. That's linear, okay? But that's more of a psychological thing to, to the person seeing the weight on the bar go up. And like, yeah, I'm definitely getting stronger. And in my mind, I'm like, well, if the subjective effort is the same and the bar speed is the same, then sure, I'm just trying to impart stress so that when we test our outcomes later, if that's something we're doing, that the improvement is there. I don't care if no weight on the bar gets added uh, you know, over a series of weeks. If it stays roughly the same, it goes down, then goes up a little bit, it goes down, it goes up a little bit. I don't necessarily care if it's within this normal range if I expect that your adaptation is gonna take place weeks later. Does that make sense? Like during a volume phase, like if I'm having somebody do a lot, a lot of reps, if you go down five pounds from the previous week, I don't know if you're weaker. I wouldn't make any changes on that. Just like if you added five pounds, I don't know if you're stronger. Just you're trying to accumulate enough stress to create and the correct type of stress to drive the adaptation that you consider important. So the week to week thing to me is a red herring. If you focus on that in the, you know, and miss the forest for the trees, you're gonna make a bunch of programming errors rather you need to look at it over a bigger period of time and, and then see what the outcome is. If you have somebody that did the same weight for five sets of five for four weeks in a row, and then you had a small peak on week five, week six, they actually tested, and their 1RM went up markedly, that, that's a successful program for that person. You tweak a few variables, they do the same thing again, and it's a bigger increase. You tweak a few more variables, they do worse. You say, ah, they didn't respond very well to that. That's how you're trying to do that, okay? even though that's not perfect. Even if you think I'm gonna change one variable at a time. Well, you're not changing one variable at a time. You're changing one variable and then more training history has gone by. The person's a different organism at the end of each training block, but you're, you're trying to do this in a way where you can keep data on a person and then once you find things that they respond uniquely well to, that they're sensitive to that. You want to use those things. And so for a competitive lifter, what I try to do is find things that they respond very, very well to. And then once I have a good feeling on that, going into a meet, I just play their greatest hits. Whatever they respond to before very, very well, I'm gonna try to do the same thing. So people say, oh, this looks like the last block that I had amazing success with. Why did you do that? I'm like, Did you hear yourself? Yeah. <laughs> Let's just do the stuff that we have a good, you know, but I've only had that email come into my inbox uh, a handful of times, because most people recognize, they see it and they're like, yes. I've been waiting for this. I had a good experience with this last time. My expectation is that I'm gonna get stronger. They have a lot of positive emotions with that and then they're gonna do better. That's the general thing. So the question's about pivot weeks. When are they appropriate? When would you program them in? Uh, so my, my feeling on this is that you should use pivot weeks to delineate between different periods of training. So overarching theme, if for a person who's very concerned with their strength outcomes on like a one to a five RM, so very specific strength improvement, that most, their volume is gonna, or sorry, their, their training uh, uh, setup overall is gonna be periods of higher volume and periods of much higher intensity. Those are the two like broad, you know, kind of categories. The volume phases are gonna last for much, much longer than the high intensity phases. And that if, when you're going in between different phases, a pivot week helps to kind of get the person prepared for the different stress that you're about to place on them and also psychologically give them a little bit of a break. Those are the two reasons I use that for. Also to introduce potentially new exercise variations that I want them to uh, get better at uh, and kind of uh, get a test run at before we really push, push the intensity. So 
you probably don't need to organize a brand new trainee's training into block you know, type, type or organize it over a series of months in advance. You're probably doing that week to week for, for a, a new trainee. But for folks who are after this novice phase, you could program pivot weeks. Yeah. Uh, and those are going to look different for different people. So some people, you know, if they're going to go from a period of higher volume, lower intensity to a higher intensity, lower volume, instead of giving them an initial t taste of this higher intensity, uh, lower volume stuff, they would actually peak very quickly if you gave that to them. You might, instead of doing like, okay, you're going to do heavy triples, that would be like a standard, like kind of bridging that gap. You'd say, all right, you're going to do heavy sets of 10 this week. And they're like, 10, what? I've been doing fives and sixes and fours. Why do you have me doing tens? It's like, yeah, it's completely different. We might pick different movements things you're unfamiliar with and that are not going to pop up again the next week. The idea is we're going to do uh, some stuff that you're not good at, you haven't done before, and you're not going to do again just to break it up. So you don't accidentally peak really quickly, but we're giving you a, a, a change between what you did before and what you did later. So my pivot weeks for myself personally right now look like that. I'll go from periods of doing uh, you know, 150 reps a week on squat, bench, deadlift, and then and, and then when it uh, switches to a higher intensity phase, I'll do, I have a week where I'm just doing tens on all the big lifts and then circuits. And people are like, what are you, why are you breathing hard? I'm like, one, because I'm out of shape for the specific demand that's being placed on me right now. Two, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's when you see me do sumo deadlifts for sets of 10, people are like, are you doing sumo now? I'm like, no, I have to do this stupid stuff, I hate it. But then the next week when I see deadlifts again, you know, I'm a little, uh, a little more sensitive to the training stuff. That's for me. We've tried it both ways and I seem to work better that way. Other folks who work better if you give them a little taste of what's to come. I peak. If instead of tens, you gave me a single at eight and a triple at nine, I might send a all, set an all-time PR for my best triple, which I don't care about. I want my one RM to go up. If my three RM goes up, my one RM doesn't move, that's a failure. <laughs> I mean, I can save it by posting on Instagram and say, yeah, all time best, 3RM. People are like, oh yeah, your 1RM is gonna, gonna be great. I'm like, nah, dude, I just peaked. <laughs> so, yeah, a lot of our templates, you'll see that in there. Uh, but we mostly, I mostly expect that people don't need that as big of a change as I do. The question is, are there any lift specific volume recommendations um, that we've seen, like i.e. differences between squat, bench, deadlift, set recommendations, volume recommendations to drive strength, which we assume we're talking about like a 1RM. Uh, not that are reliably consistent, meaning that I can't say, yeah, everybody needs more upper body volume than lower body volume. I can't say that because some people are very, very sensitive to, meaning that they over respond to what you would predict based on a, uh, you know, that sort of logical intuition. So I have found in practice and accepting all the bias that that phrase uh, uh, connotes. In my experience. Yeah, in my experience, the most dangerous three words that a doctor can say to you, um, that most people require similar levels of volume for the squat and the deadlift. I find that training the deadlift infrequently leads to an undertrained deadlift. Big surprise. I have found that the upper body tolerates more volume than the squat and the deadlift, meaning that you can do it without seeing this huge drop off in performance that, but that doesn't necessarily lead to greater performance improvements. Doesn't necessarily. I find a far more reliable correlation between bench frequency and performance compared to overall bench volume. Meaning that if I have somebody bench more often versus necessarily more reps, they tend to bench more. So you could have somebody who's benching 100 reps per week but only benching twice, 50 reps, 50 reps, versus somebody benching that same amount of volume spread out over five days. But that's more of an individual basis, but that's just been my general gestalt for how I've seen people do this. Uh, I, I troll uh, Mark, our web guy, and sometimes Austin, about releasing a program called the BED program, the Bench Every Day program, because I think it'd be a hit. Our newsletter list would like, Skyrocket through like, I want to bench every day. You got a program? Sick. Uh, but I've had fairly substantial results with people who bench every day for a period, like two or three weeks, working up to um, 
like a single at eight, single at nine, sometimes with, sometimes without different variations, they tend to add weight to their bench press. They get more frequent practice to the test that they're going to do at the meet. And uh, so that makes sense. But people have also done the same thing with squat every day. Yep. Yep. It's a practice thing. Yep. Yep. So I think that works for a short period of time for people who see, who could use a little improvement in their uh, either skill, skill work or who from a psychological standpoint, that exposure gets them more comfortable to regularly exposing themselves to limit sets that aren't terribly fatiguing. So this bench everyday thing is, you're gonna work up to a single at eight and either no back off work on what were previously non-training days, or on training days you're doing your normal training and you were gonna do a single anyway. Does that make sense? So it's not, I'm not trying to apply too much extra stress acutely, I'm building them up to it. One time Leah was benching seven days a week the biggest improvement she had was seven and a half kilos in three weeks going into a meet, set all-time PR, which was cool. Uh, I had another person whose name I cannot name. I had her on a, she was, she went from deadlift, we did this on, on the bench and the deadlift, her bench went up 30 pounds, her deadlift went up 50 pounds. She deadlifted uh, five times a week. So I couldn't bring myself to have her pull every day. But it <laughs> turns out, pulling more makes you pull more. I know, it's weird. Uh, so I guess my answer to that would be the volume thing I have not observed as reliably as I, I would need to see in order to make a general recommendation. The exposure thing I think is a more interesting and more reliable finding that I've found. I think one of the recent things, only other things I would add on that, there's, some, there's a recent uh, fairly large meta-analysis on training frequency and I think that did have some findings. Of course, you have to consider the issues with meta-analysis in general, the studies that went into it. The other thing being that outputs, what they spit out, ha often have to do with averages instead of viewing the broad spectrum of responses, right? So any of this kind of training-related study stuff, they spit out averages, but it's really nice when a study provides start, date, start point, end point for each subject in the study, because then you can see, do most people trend up, or is it an average line that went up and then a substantial portion of people went down, whatever. I think it tended to show some improved outcomes, in particular from a frequency standpoint for the upper body lifts which would support this uh, kind of observation. That's Logically made, made my way to that. <laughs> right. Um, and then from a hypertrophy standpoint, uh, I think most of the literature on this sort of thing suggests that, you know, uh, there are dose, we've talked about dose responses and a hypertrophy effect. Again, this is on an average population kind of level when you do these studies. Uh, I think that I can probably safely say that, you know, like for the overwhelming majority of people, greater than 10 sets a week is better than yeah. less than 10 sets a week. Yeah, uh, but once you get into that range, things get fuzzy for each lift. So, you know, I know that I tend to typically squat anywhere from 14 to 18 sets a week on the squat, for example, and usually something similar on the deadlift and then something higher into the 20s on, on the bench, for example. But many of my trainees have different proportions of those sorts of things. I don't think I have many or anyone really who's training substantially fewer sets than 10 per week on a given, on a given lift. Um, and then in bodybuilding land, things get crazy and they go like, yeah, we have evidence up to 45 sets a week on stuff and that's like a separate situation because there's a ton of isolation work, lower fatigue potential compared to what we do with our barbell lifts. So. What's, the, what's the most volume you've ever done on one of the big lifts in one session? Nine sets of five, I think. Same, yeah, nine sets of five. And people say, nine sets of five, that's gonna kill me. Well, yeah, if you've only done three sets of five. But you start out by doing four sets of five, later on, five sets of five, six sets. I mean, you, you have to work up. I don't wanna do nine sets of five. Do you understand how annoying that is? <laughs> Further, if when I program similar volumes for Leah, do you know how annoying that is? I have to stay there and spot her for nine sets of five on the bench press? It's the worst, it's the worst. So. You work up over time, and then the idea is that once somebody stops responding to that, you can pivot to a different training focus and ideally return back to the same or similar amounts of stress that you previously had and still get a response. Once that stops happening, you have to up the dose. That's why deload works on LP. You, you know, taking stress off, you peak a little bit, you can run back up maybe a little bit further, but it stops working. And it's not going to work again unless you up the dose.
know what's funny? Oh, is you have less body hair than me. Yeah. And this is a problem. Oh, so mine sticks on better. Yeah, yeah, I should have shaved. Should have got waxed. All right, next question. 